So, yeah, sorry, I changed the title a bit. Uh, so I am going to talk about delivering care to COVID patients and how new advanced techniques in machine learning and sensing can help with that. Okay, so step back and try to think about what is the hardest challenge with COVID? Why COVID is much harder than many other diseases? It's really because it's very contagious. It's very contagious, it spreads very fast, but also it puts a huge toll on the healthcare workers because every time they want to like try to help a patient, just even simply like trying to measure the vitals of a patient, they might catch the disease themselves. So the question that we ask, how can we help healthcare workers care for the patients, monitor their uh, vitals and other physiological signals without actually risking catching the disease themselves? Ideally, without having to even get close to the patients at all. So this is what my lab has been developing. So imagine if a device like your Wi-Fi box a device that sits in the environment can just monitor the wireless signals around and from that can get the patient's breathing, heart rate, sleep, movements, and other physiological signals without any contact with the patient's body from a distance. Now, we actually have invented such a device. We call it the Emerald uh, Wireless Box. And when I say this, many people still ask me, okay, so, so really how do you get the respiration of the patient, like, or the heartbeat, like you have to like put a sensor, maybe a wrist um, a device or something like that. No, actually, we can get all of these physiological signals without touching the patient, just purely by analyzing the wireless signals. And the reason for this is that you guys now are sitting, like you agree with me, you are sitting in a sea of wireless signals wherever you are in the audience sitting at home or in any, in any place. There are so many wireless signals around you. And every single move that you do, right? You take a breath, it changes the electromagnetic waves around you. And what we managed to do is to invent machine learning algorithms that analyze these electromagnetic waves to extract breathing, heartbeats, sleep, mobility, et cetera. So let me show you an idea how this works. So at a very high level, wireless signals, of course, spread in the environment. They reflect of the human body because our bodies are full of water. And some of these reflections come back to our device, which analyzes them. This is an example here of a fall. It can detect it. It can alert the caregiver via text, email, or phone message. Now, these devices that we invented are very sensitive. They can track all types of motion. And let me start by showing you an example. And then eventually, I will show you how we get to, to, to the COVID patient and what we monitor to the, for them. So let me start with motion. So here, this is an office at MIT. The device is not even in the same office. It's in the adjacent office behind this wall. So you see this big arrow. So we're gonna monitor this person through the wall. Now this red dot here is where the device thinks this person is standing right now. So let me uh, play this video. And as he moves, look at how the red dot is tracking him. So it can track him pretty accurately, knowing where exactly he is at any point in time. So this is actually, it's important to understand the mobility and that are actually like being able to be mobile in your environment, understand the activity and where people are is important to behavior, is important to understanding fatigue. But actually the device not only understand mobility, but it can sense very small motion. So let me show you this. So this person is like you now sitting and actually he's reading. And what you see on the screen is his inhales, exhales, inhales, exhales. And I say that he has problem breathing. So here he is holding his breath and you see the signal stays at a steady level because he exhaled, he did not inhale. Now let's zoom in on the signal. So this is a breathing signal. You see the inhales, you see the exhales. And these small blips on the signal are his heartbeats. 
So imagine without touching the person from a distance, without any risk of contagion or even getting any close to the body, we can get his vitals, his mobility, where he is, what he's doing. But not only this, we can also get his sleep. So when you go to sleep, your brain waves change and you enter different stages, awake, light sleep, deep sleep, and rapid eye movements or REM. Now, these sleep stages are very important, of course, for understanding sleep disorders, but as I'm going to show you later, in fact, it is related to COVID in the sense that I'm sure all of you have heard about this vivid dreams and COVID people have problems with sleeping and when they, they have these vivid dreams that they, they uh, happens to a large fraction of the patient. So dreaming happens typically in, in rapid eye movement, REM. And REM disruption is related to variety of diseases. So we're gonna see an example in, in COVID, but actually, for example, in depression, REM also gets disrupted. Uh, in Alzheimer, deep sleep get disrupted. So sleep is just a platform for a variety of diseases. Now today, if you wanna monitor sleep, you have to send your patient to the hospital. They put these sensors on his head and body and they ask him to sleep like this. Now, this is of course very hard way. And of course, it's not even thinkable if you want to get information about the sleep of, of COVID patient. So here is our device. It transmits very low power wireless signal, 1,000 times lower power than your average Wi-Fi, analyzes it with machine learning, and spits out the sleep stages that you see here. See, so these are the sleep stages of this person. He's sleeping in his own bedroom on his own bed without any sensors on his body. Now, of course, uh, we compared all of these metrics to the gold standard in the field and proved that they actually are accurate. So for example, in, in, in sleep, we compare to EEG-based FDA-approved devices for monitoring sleep. When we compare to, 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 to breathing, we compare to chest uh, belt uh, that is also FDA-approved. And we showed that we are accurate and that we have the ability to deliver these metrics in a contactless way. Now, before COVID, uh, of course, this has application beyond COVID and we have deployed these devices and analyzed and working with the healthcare industry, pharmaceutical industry in variety of diseases such as Parkinson, FSHD, Alzheimer's, Crohn's, uh, COPD, atopic dermatitis. But of course, when COVID came, it was very natural to think about how you can use contactless monitoring of patients to monitor COVID. So this is our device and you see it on the wall here. It's very non-obtrusive and just disappear into the environment. In fact, you can see a similar device in my room here in the back behind me. I use it to monitor my sleep. So, let me tell you now about how we use this monitoring for COVID patients. Now, if you think about COVID, the vast majority of patients are not treated in the hospital. Patients get diagnosed, most, most of the time they, they get uh, sent back to the home and with instruction that if things get bad, they should reach out and seek medical help. Now, this is problematic because first of all, we know by now that COVID can have bad turns at a variety of points throughout the recovery process, particularly like around the, the end of the first week of the recovery process after diagnosis, people can have bad turns. And COVID patients are really bad at assessing the severity of their diseases. On one hand, there are many patients actually who get delirium and they are not aware, fully aware of their state. And second, many COVID patients, actually the people who are at higher risk, there are the older people and older people, of course, many of them may have dementia, may have cognition issues, and also may not have the ability to, to seek med uh, medical help very quickly. So how can you have these COVID patients, tell them to go back and self-isolate at home, but at the same time, not isolating them from the care they need? 
So we monitored COVID patients, and particularly we monitor elderly patient in retirement home. And I'm gonna show you some aspect of how recovery happens in these COVID patients. So of course, COVID is a uh, the first um, thing that we know about COVID is that it is a respiratory disease. So in fact, the uh, one of the very important aspect of recovery is how the breathing of the patient is changing. So here, what you see in this uh, is the difference between the breathing of the patient here on April 7 and April 11. This is the first time, of course, a patient is monitored remotely with a uh, uh, a wireless device in completely contactless manner. And you can see as the patient to recover over the period of four days, the breathing has changed drastically from much faster speed breathing rate to a more relaxed breathing rate that is closer to the patient baseline. Now, that's not the only thing. Of course, mobility also changes. So again, here you can see the patient speed at moving. So on April 8th and on April 11th. So let's play this again. The patient again moving from the chair to the bathroom. And you can see how much more agile and faster she is on April 11th in comparison to April 8th. So this patient is recovering and recovering smoothly. Now, you see other things that are interesting. As I said, we keep hearing about COVID patients or at least some percentage of the patient, they have these hallucination and vivid dreams. Now, REM is the stage of sleep during which we dream. So this is an example from a COVID patient. You see here, this patient went to sleep slightly before 10 p.m. She was in awake and then she went to light sleep and then deep sleep, like few excursion to deep sleep, and then she went to REM. So this period here is REM. Now sleep typically goes in cycles. So this is the first sleep cycle, the second sleep cycle, etc. So this long REM here of 90 minutes is in the first sleep cycle. Now in the first sleep cycle on average, people like healthy people like me and you, they have 10 minutes of REM on average. So 90 minutes of REM in the first sleep cycle is not common. And it is sometimes associated with basically vivid dreams, hallucination, et cetera. Now, of course, COVID is new and we have we are just starting to monitor these patients and get information about them. So then we need to collect much larger amount of data before we can assert all of these observations. But these observations are very interesting and important for the doctors who are now trying to care for patients remotely. So let me show you another thing that actually not all recovery, of course, go well. Sometimes patients have problems. So this is this is the breathing of actually of a COVID patient. Remember like the breathing that I showed you earlier, the nice ups and downs, inhales, exhales. Look at this breathing and how much irregular it is. And even if you are not a doctor, you look at this and say, how, this is not really great breathing, All right? So, so we see abnormality, variety of abnormality in breathing signals in patients. And I wanna show you that actually breathing is really interesting and important. So I want you to look at this patient. This patient actually uh, the recovery process was not smooth and she ended up being re-hospitalized. So let me explain this graph. This blue curve here, every one of these blue curves is a histogram of the respiration rate of the patient on a particular day. So here you see where my cursor is. This is April 8th. And this is the, the histogram of the breathing rate of this patient. And you can see the tip, the mode is around like 18 breaths per minute. So at the beginning, the patient was recovering fine and the breathing rate was decreasing. But then get to, to April 14 here and you see that the breathing rate just jumped. And indeed on this day, the patient ended up in the hospital. She was hospitalized. She was hospitalized for a whole week. And after she came back, this is the, the next breathing after a week on April 21. And now you can see that the respiration again decreasing and eventually the patients recover.
So, so what we notice is actually respiration is very important for the disease and understanding how, how well the patient is doing. Because even when the patient does not uh, actively, like we hear, of course, that when patients complain about breathing distress, I mean, this is something, of course, indicative of the disease. But in many cases, the patient is not even saying that they have breathing problem because a patient cannot tell that their breathing rate has increased, for example, by two breaths per minute or three breaths per minute. They don't know that. They know when they have, like when they reach the extreme and they have breathing distress. But if you look at the breathing, actually, you can differentiate between uh, different types of, uh, of recovery process. So here I'm showing you three stories of how patient COVID patients recover. So the first one is for patients who end up having bad or problems during recovery. And as you can see, the breathing rate at some point jumps. And then the middle column is smooth recovery. And as you can see, breathing rate is smoothly decreasing until the patient fully recover. And then we know that there are some patients who are asymptomatic. And as you can see, the patient have no problem. Breathing is showing that this patient is the same. After, like when he had COVID, after they recovered from COVID, everything is the same. Dina, you have uh, very little time. I was wondering if you can conclude. Uh, sure. So let me actually jump then to uh, the, the end of what I want to say here. So COVID is not the last pandemic. And so the question to ask ourselves is what do we learn from COVID? And definitely we learned many things. In particular, we learned how to move our workspace online and to the home via Zoom, like what we are doing now. But what do we learn for the healthcare system? And I think the most important thing to learn is that we need to bring healthcare to the home. Because basically, we, what we learned, like we, we were forced to send the patient to their home to recover, but we currently have no mechanism to actually deliver the care and monitor those patients in the home. So if we, if we are to think about what is the take home message from everything that we are going through, not just for if there is a second COVID wave, but actually for future pandemic and for healthcare as a whole, for chronic diseases, for everything is what can we learn from this so that we can provide and bring healthcare and bring the care to the home in the most efficient way. And I will stop here, Dimitri. Thank you very much, Tina. There are a few questions. One has to do uh, with privacy matters. How do you ensure you only collect data from people who have granted permission to store their health data? Yes, so that's of course very important. So uh, on one hand, I want to emphasize that everything that we do is according to a uh, proper protocol and IRB approval. The second thing is that when uh, we monitor someone, for a short period of time, we ask them to wear a small accelerometer to tie the wireless signal with the acceleration. And then we, we train the machine learning model about their wireless signals, and they, we can remove the acceleration after that. So, uh, so basically, it's based on a machine learning classifier that separates the, the wireless signal of the patient from other people in the environment. Also, does the device track multiple patients at a time? Yes, so I didn't show example here, but of course, yeah, we can separate different people in the environment. And if different people want to be tracked, like in some cases we do clinical trials where actually both the patient and the caregiver are part of this clinical trial, and then we deliver data for both. And is the device sensitive to the influence of other electrical devices, for example, a mobile phone? So the, the device, I tell people that we, we actually, if there is a place where you can test that the device does not interfere with other wireless devices and also does not suffer from interference, it's our wireless lab at MIT because there are all the weird signals. Yeah, of, the device is designed a particular way not to interfere with cell phones, with any other devices. And in fact, it has been tested even in the hospital. Um, and I'll check that it is, um, does not interfere for, uh, with other devices. Um, and last question, H has the device also looked into uh, heart rate set and COVID patients have tachycardia? 
So we haven't looked particularly at heart rate of the patients, uh, but we, as I mentioned, uh, technologically we have paper and we show that we can actually capture the heart rate. When we uh, deploy devices in the field, we have to make certain trade-offs and getting the heart rate requires very high sampling rate and which which makes the device much more expensive and also it's hard to transfer this information over the internet. So we, we made a choice that we, we, uh, we, don't, uh, we didn't collect the heart rate for this particular test. Although it is, we show that we can collect heart rate with this device. Thank you very much, Tina. Um... Thanks, Dimitri and everyone.